Hello and welcome to this episode of Demystified as we explore home cooking in a modern world. Hello, I'm Linda and I'm here with Paul. Hi Paul. Hello Linda. How are you going? It's a Friday fun one. <laughs> it is a Friday and today we were talking about bread. Yes, well we've sort of touched on bread a few times in the last few podcasts. So we might dive a bit deeper um, because as we know there's a lot of flour flo- floating around in the world. Um, yes. I still can't, although I do. You know, sometimes I don't usually go to the supermarket, but last night I did, and there was no flour again. Plain flour, self-raising flour. There was a bit of corn flour, um, but yeah, so there was no actual baking flour at all. Even the pre-mixed stuff gone. I can't remember the last time I used corn flour other than for making custard. I do have a good story about flours, as in corn flour and all that sort of stuff. Okay, yeah. this is a time. Oh, okay, share. Go okay. on. Why not? Well. Uh, a few years back when I was on the on poverty's door, if I wasn't already in the house, um, Valentine's Day came along, and I know we've already passed Valentine's Day, but I had no money to to give um, my partner a Valentine's Day present, or oh, I had very little money. So what I did do, and I thought I was being quite clever, uh, I went to a market, I think I went to a market. I didn't go to a supermarket. I went to a market. And you know, you go to a market and you see the guys that have got nuts and flowers and spices and mm-hmm. sort of those dry dry store places within a market. So I went there and I bought continental flour, B-sand flour, plain flour, self-raising flour, corn flour, um, banana flour. I can't remember what I bought about 10 different types of flour. And then I put them all in a bunch. Oh, no. And no. I gave her a bunch of flowers. <laughs> I thought it was quite good. Well, you could have just gone into someone's garden and just grabbed some flowers. That's stealing, Linda. If it's hanging over the fence, but Paul, it's not it's original. Not. Paul, getting I'm a whole heap of like one kilo. I'm surprised kilo, you didn't open them up and sprinkle them all over your head. One kilo bags of flour together. It is a bunch and of. And given flowers. that she doesn't like cooking very no. much, so I'm but surprised thought, you're still together after that romantic yes. gesture. I thought it was quite good. <laughs> oh, seriously, anyway. Paul, we'll talk off air about what's a good present to give your partner. I thought that was clever, but yeah, anyway, no. bread. Um, so let's let's talk about bread. So we've talked a little bit about sourdough. Now's a good time to do a sourdough culture. Yes. Um, and for those of you who haven't watched it already, please check out the instructional video on, that you can access from either our website at cookingwithsteam.com or YouTube. Yeah, just just stick into YouTube, Cooking with Steam, and there's a two-part tutorial on how to actually start your culture and then how to use it, what to do with it, how long it takes, how to look after it, baby it, care for it, whatever. Um, but today we might sort of park that because we there is a bit of info out there about that but and we'll just talk about you know standard yeast leaving doughs um and we might focus in on you know the sort of instant yeast because that seems to be disappearing off the shelves as well so i think a lot of people at the moment are baking um and bread baking probably for the first time um so i suppose uh the variety is is one good thing about baking but even if you're doing just a standard loaf um, you know, a white loaf, let's say, even a tin, do it in a tin, free form, whatever you like. Um, get a base recipe right first. So just do a very simple standard white bread recipe. If you're going to use white, you know, white flour, um, get that right first. And then once you get that right and understand the principles, then you can expand on it. Um, a lot of bread recipes will tell you to make sure the yeast is activated. Generally, that instant yeast that you find on the shelves in the supermarkets, uh, it's in pouches, like seven gram pouches. I haven't yet come across one that hasn't activated. And a lot of recipes will tell you to put that in some water, whisk it, 
and wait till it starts bubbling and foaming like a the head on a beer almost. Um, which yeah, fine you can do, but realistically, like you can actually just throw it into the flour. The thing is with yeast, if you throw it in with the flour and salt, and let's say you're going to bake bread in the morning and you want to get all your ingredients weighed out the night before, uh, who knows, right? If you put your yeast and your salt together, the salt will kill the yeast. I didn't know that. Yeah, so keep those two things separate unless you're going to mix it straight away. Okay. okay. Um, if your bread has like a brioche, if it has sugar in it, um, the yeast feeds off the sugar, so it's not a bad thing. But salt, keep the salt away from yeah, instant, well, any yeast really for that matter, but instant yeast is a good one. But what I was going back to is get yourself a good base recipe. There are a million out there for easy breads, and most of them are pretty standard. It'll be, you know, four or 500 grams of flour, anywhere between two and 300 grams of water, yeast, and salt. I mean, that's really the basics and mm-hmm. of, of all breads. That's what you need. Um and the trick to a lot of it is obviously in the kneading. Now, if you've got a stand mixer with a dough hook, they're kind of handy machine. Um, but if you're first up doing bread for the first time, get your hands in there and get a feel for the dough. Uh, it'll give you a much better understanding and indication of when your dough is ready, to, when it's been kneaded enough and you've worked the gluten enough. Um, well, what are you looking for there, Paul? Because if you haven't cooked before yep. and you're using your hands to make dough for the first time and kneading it, yep. what are you looking for? Uh, so for you want of- something sort of uh, reasonably smooth, okay? So uh, if you can imagine you put your hands in a bowl of flour and water and it's quite claggy and gluggy and it'll stick to your hands. And Now, the more you work it and use it... Yeah, the more you work it and knead it and the warmth from your hands as well plays a part in this. Um, the dough will... If, there are a lot of terms you can use, but it will smooth out. Now, the best way to get a feel for that is once you actually start forming the dough together, get all of that gunk and stuff off your hands, go wash your hands, and then once it's sort of formed, come back to it with clean hands because you'll never get a good feel from it if you've still got sticky bits on your hands and that mm. never incorporates properly into the dough. So you get a much better feel for your dough with clean hands and the more you work it, the smoother it'll come. Now, it's a bit hard to explain in a podcast, but if you pick up... I think I did this in the um, in the video tutorial for sourdough. The same principle applies. But if you pick up the dough with two hands and kind of shake it until it starts to uh, carry its own weight and thin out. And bakers often refer to it as the window pane effect. So you can see light coming through the dough, but it holds its shape and it doesn't tear away. So a a dough that hasn't been kneaded enough Mm -hmm. will tear, whereas that will hold its own weight. So you just grab sort of the ends of the dough and shake it until the weight comes to the base. So you're holding it in midair. You shake, shake, shake until the weight comes to the base and then you should be able to see light coming through. If you wave your hand on the other side of it, you should see your hand, not clearly, but you should see the shadow of your hand um, and that's a good indicator that your dough's had enough kneading. But first time, always go by hand, I say, uh, and that way you get a feel for it because every time will be different. No matter how good your scales are, no matter how good your recipe is, every time will be slightly different. Humidity in the air, how warm your hands are, the bench that you're working on. There are a lot of variables. Now, the other thing to point out with dough and when you're doing a dough is everyone, especially with a sourdough, this is noticeable, but depending on what sort of bread you're making, some are, for want of a better term, wetter than others. So some recipes will have more moisture content in it and be much stickier. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing with something that is sticky, like... Like a focaccia or... Yeah, or any sort of dough. Like okay. you, you, some, some will be stickier than others. Like a brioche is probably a better example because mm-hmm. it's got butter and eggs and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, but some will feel a lot tackier and stickier than others. Follow the recipe to a point, but avoid adding a whole heap of flour. You should be able to knead a dough on a bench top without it sticking, without adding extra flour. 
if you continue to add flour so it doesn't stick, you'll end up with a really, really dense, heavy bread in the end. And dough will continue to swallow up that flour. The more you add it, it will just take it. And it will take it, 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 and it won't stop taking on that flour until you end up with a rock. So follow the recipe, and if you're going to dust your bench, fine, do that, but you'll, you'll get a much better feel if your hands are clean. Much, much better feel. So I generally still to this day will do my mixes in a stand mixer with a dough hook, but I'll always pull them out and knead them by hand just to get a feel for where I'm at uh, after they've mixed for five or 10 minutes. So general kneading time for let's say a 400 gram, 500 gram loaf is you know it's somewhere between eight and 10 minutes. But as I say, it, it varies. Now, yeah, it's a bit of a workout, but you know it's not bad for you. Um, so I give mine about five or six minutes in the mixer, just until the dough's sort of looking smooth, all the ingredients have pulled away, it should form one nice, tight, not tight, but one nice smoothish ball, I suppose. And then I pull it out and give it a knead by hand, and just, just to make sure it's ready to, it's had enough kneading. And the mistake that I made, the first time I made bread in the combi steam oven, can you remember what I no. did? It's too many mistakes to remember, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> sadly, sadly, you're right there. But I used the water was too hot, mm. and it killed the yeast. Yeah, yeah. So Did that, you know that? Yeah, so yes. that, that's also another thing. And with your leftover yeast, keep it in the freezer. Yes, I do. So it will, will keep almost, well, pretty much indefinitely in the freezer, as long as it's in a sealed container. Um so yeah, keep your yeast in the freezer. And the reason I say get a base dough, because if you can imagine, let's just, and I'm only going to use, we'll just use a white base dough as a starting point, because wholemeal flours, rye flours, all the different flours react slightly differently to moisture and kneading and all that sort of stuff. There's a whole bunch of variables. Gluten-free is another world unto itself. Um, but all of the flours react kind of differently, but which is why I want to start with a white. So if you want to do wholemeal, get a good wholemeal base first. Because if you can do a good, simple white loaf, then you can add to it. So then you can start adding some rosemary and olives. Then you, then you can add some other flavorings to it. You can add some cinnamon and dried fruits. Now they're not perfect like fruit loaves, but you're just slowly developing. Give yourself a good base. It's like what we say when people get a new appliance or a new oven, first thing you should do is, is cook something you're familiar with. So get a good familiar base first and then expand on that. Because once you understand how doughs work and how they feel, it's really, a, it's like making gnocchi for me. It's a feel thing. Like we do have quite a few bread and dough based recipes from bagels to cinnamon hot cross scrolls. buns yeah. to cinnamon yeah. scrolls. Like there's a million, there's heaps of them, um, and all of those doughs vary slightly, but you, it's the really in the touch for me. Like it, it always has been. So, yeah, get yourself a good base, and then you can expand on it. So, you know, and then you'll learn how to make pizza dough, which is another. You know, I mean, it's effectively a bread, and you know, you've got focaccias and all those other mm. things. Um, but get yourself a good base to start with. It's like having a good pasta dough. If you've got a good pasta dough, not only can you make linguine, but you can make ravioli, agnolotti, tortellini, spaghettini. Like, you, but you, without a good base, none of those things are going to be possible. And so you mentioned before wholemeal, rye. It's one of Dougie's favourites is rye. Oh, is it? Yeah, I've always been. And uh, from his time living in New York all those many years ago before he... Uh, Pastrami on rye. Met me. Oh, he used... And he used to love... That's where he developed his love of bagels. Yeah. Which is another bread. Yeah. And I know we have a bagel recipe on cooking with steam. Yeah, so that's a converted recipe from a traditional method because bagels are boiled, boiled. Eff effectively. Mm. But what we did was skip, obviously, the boiling phase and actually steam them. Which works quite well. Yeah, it does. Yeah. But yeah. he loves rye and um, and so if you're gonna change the base flour, what would say like is there a rule of thumb to say what, yeah, so how does it how does it look if you're making a wholemeal or a uh, a rye 
mix. Yeah, so if you take, let's say, your white as your base, um, generally that, let's say, that, that base mixture of, like off the top of my head, I can't even remember, like, let's say 400 grams of flour and 250 grams of water as your white base, um, that probably won't convert for a rye or a wholemeal because rye and wholemeal are like denser, I suppose, is the answer. Um, so they probably have a little bit more water in them, probably. You know, I don't know. Um, I have recipes for all of those things, but they're all in my head. Um, <laughs> And they're not out right now. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff in your head, Paul. Which... Yeah, yeah, bag of flowers. Um, so, but generally, the as you differ the flour, you'll differ the ratio between liquid and, and flour. Also, important to remember if you want to know what uh, end result you're going to have, just total up the weight of the water and the flour, and that gives you a gram weight of the loaf. So if you've got 400 and 200, 600 grams. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah. it, that's the, your best indicator of how big your loaf is going to be because um, you don't want to be putting a kilo loaf into a small 22-centimetre loaf or 18-centimetre loaf tin because it won't bake properly. It'll be too big. It'll raise up way too high. Um, so, yeah, your, your loaf weight, for want of a better term, will add those two together and that gives you the weight of what the loaf... It's not what the loaf will be, but what will fit in the appropriate container, tin, whatever it is you like. I've never thought of that before. Well, there you are. Yeah, so... I've never thought of that. Just how you gauge that dough and looking at the available tins because our house is, even though we renovated, it's still quite small in our storage for tins. So I've only really got a couple. Yeah. So I tend to bag just open without a tin, just put it on a yeah. tray. Let and it, of course you can do that. Let it hang there yeah. on its own. But I mean, like, you know, tins only sort of will dictate shape, mm. really. But you need an appropriate tin to make sure the loaf bakes properly. Now, when it comes to the baking, or I suppose we should talk about proving, proving. a little bit. Um, so there are a lot of, well, there's a few different methods to proving. Um, we do ours in the steam oven, of course. So when we're talking about this instant yeast, um, warm, humid is the best, okay? So you made the mistake of putting water that was too hot. A lot of recipes will call for lukewarm water. Um, that's to get the yeast on the move and get it activating and going. Um, so while that's great, and it might advance it slightly, if you go from that and putting it in your house where you, it's cold, that, that dough isn't going to prove. All right? So it needs a consistent warm temperature to work. Um, blood temperature is about right. So anywhere between sort of 36 and 38 degrees. You can get it upwards of 40 if, if you like. You don't want to go above sort of 45 and certainly not up to 50. 50 degrees, it'll actually start very slightly cooking the dough. So it's a bit too hot. Um, so anywhere between sort of 36 and let's say 42, anywhere in there will work. And just for those who don't have thermometers at home, that would be if you put the water on your wrist, if you can feel it. Yeah. Yeah, like the old-fashioned way we used to do baby bottles before we had science ovens. I'm not that old. Yes, well, <laughs> yes, you are. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm sure you are. No. But that's, but that's you know, just yeah. to test it, stick yeah. your finger. So, it on yeah, your, on I, your and wrist. the risk of, the risk of uh, adding too hot a liquid is what happened to you. You kill the yeah. yeast. So alternatively, you can use cold water. Now, warm water will react a little bit differently when you first mix your dough, and the, and the, the flour will, will drink up that liquid a bit faster than it will with cold water. Okay. Just a little Again. bit, like slightly. It gives you and it gives you a little bit of a feel, which is why I tend to use cold water, not fridge cold, just tap temperature, mm -hmm. whatever that is. I've got no idea what tap water temperature is. I suppose you should find out. What did you say? Like well, when fourteen I fill up degrees. The kettle, when I fill up the uh, the lovely KitchenAid kettle that we've got. Oh, it's got a digital thing on it. It's got a digital thing, and I think it comes in between twenty and thirty. 22, 23. Yeah, okay. Somewhere about that. But in winter, it might be 
14, yeah. 18, but this somewhere is, like that. Yeah, about okay. now, yeah. Okay, but I tend to use cold water, well, tap temperature water, um, because I get consistency about the feel of the dough. So if I use warm water, it just feels a bit different when okay. I'm kneading it by hand. Um, and that being said, I generally, barring sourdough, will prove the doughs in the steam oven. So we set it to 35, 36, whatever, and it's humid too. And I like the humidity in there because humidity, effectively steam, um, carries temperature eight times better than dry heat. Okay, so it's just more effective at maintaining temperature. So it holds the temperature much better. Now you can certainly set your oven, if you can, set your regular convection oven, whatever you have, to a nice low temperature. You can certainly prove in there. Um, what I would suggest is that whatever bowl you're proving in, wrap it in cling film or plastic. A tea towel is not going to work for you there because... It's letting dry heat in and it will start to dry the dough out. It's not going to affect the proof too much, but it might put a skin on it. And if it puts a skin on it, that skin's going to end up somewhere in the middle of your bread. So, I've never seen a, a normal oven go down that low, though. Uh, so they do now. Do they? Yeah, okay. a lot of them do now. Oh, so, okay. And a lot, of, a, a lot of them will claim to have like a, a proof setting or a rapid proof or a fast proof or whatever. Proving oh, okay. takes as long as proving takes. That's... You know, and you're generally looking for something that's, yeah, I'm going to, you know, paint a sort of wide picture here, but it's something that's doubled in size is a, is a good indicator. Okay. You can overproof too, um, but most people don't have the patience to overproof, so it's not worth worrying about too much. So if you're doing it in a dry heat oven without any moisture, um, you can add a pan of moisture, a pan of water, but because the water is not staying really that warm and there's very little movement, you're not creating the same sort of humidity. Uh, so a little bit doesn't really translate. Um, so if you've got a steam oven, absolutely works beautifully. Uh, you can put it in there uncovered too. Oh, okay. I was yeah. going to say, I always put a bit of cling yeah, wrap Yeah, you can over. put some cling wrap over. I mean, your oven is particularly yeah, well, wet. It's an old school, it's an older school steam oven that doesn't stay there's a lot of dry. Moisture yeah, on there's the a top. lot of moisture on the yeah. surface and stuff mm. like that. These days, well, I mean, the ovens that I use these days, they're pretty dry. So I just bung it straight in, no cover, no nothing. And I don't get excess moisture adding to my dough. So it's not a problem. So just think about the circumstances you're in. Certainly don't be scared about covering in glad wrap and putting it in the oven at 40 degrees. It's not going to do anything. Um, now, alternative to those methods, you can also leave it out on your bench top in a warm spot. Yeah, people say warm spot. What's a warm spot? If you have a freestanding oven, just turn the oven on to about 180 and put it on top of the freestanding oven and just let it sit there. Um, again, I prefer cling film rather than a tea towel because I don't want to get a skin on it. But it depends on your dough too. And the environment, if your house is a little bit humid then it doesn't matter so much. Um, but if your house is particularly cold, I tend to also avoid putting in direct sunlight, uh, although sunlight will create some warmth. If you're going to put it in a sunny window, cling wrap and a tea towel. So I do both. But if it's getting heat, remember that the window is going to reflect some more heat onto whatever it is, that whatever the bowl is that you're keeping it in. Um, so it sort of magnifies the heat a little bit like magnifying glass. So just be aware that okay. you don't have to keep an eye on it. Um, and yeah, any depending on your environment, except for in an oven, a steam oven, where we know that generally a kilo loaf, which is a large quantity of dough, I can generally get that done in a, around 40 to 45 minutes. It's a closed environment. It's a perfect humid environment for yeast. Uh, so that's about 40, 45 minutes. But if your house is cold, you can be two hours. Or more, yeah. Yeah, or more. So there's a lot of variables. So if, you, if you've got your basic dough right, how do you manage then to make, say, rolls? Is it just a matter of dividing it up? Yeah. That's all? Yeah. So, and if you want consistency, um, just weigh the dough. 
I've seen you do this. Yeah. I have seen you take your chef's knife and a wobbly looking bit of dough and somehow when you've just carved it up and you've uh, rolled them and you, you use both hands when you're rolling and they all look, they're like within two grams of each other. Yeah, I don't but know no, how I, you, Yeah, but that's because like I weigh a, them. Oh, okay. Oh, no, no, no. 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 I oh, have yeah. never seen you weigh them. This is a skill that oh, okay. I don't Well, do. the way that I do it is, um, so if I've got a lump of dough um, and I've got a vague idea of how big I want, let's say we're doing little dinner rolls or something like that. I do often little like dinner loaves, like mm. mini loaves. Um, what I will do is put the dough out on the bench, make a semi-uniform shape of it, not necessarily square or round, but a semi-uniform shape. I cut that shape in half and then I cut that half in half and then just work my way down until I get anywhere to between sort of eight and 16, 12 pieces in each half. And then I just roll them out. So you can do it that way, or if you want, you can just weigh out sections of dough and then roll them out. Now, rolling them out into perfect balls, um, a baker taught me how to do it on the bench top. You don't want to roll it in between your hands. You actually want the dough sitting on the surface, and it's very hard to explain, but you kind of cup your fingers and you, you semi-push down at the start, cup your fingers, and you sort of bring the dough up into a a round shape. It's really hard to explain. I've seen you do yeah. this and I've seen you do it while you're talking, while you're almost answering your phone and you've got both hands going at the same time. Yeah, but I mean, you don't it's even like, know that you're, yeah, it's you're doing like it. It's like anything with cooking though. That's practice. Yeah. Like that's, it's not about being well, any more skilled than anyone else. Watch, and then I go home and I try to, you should see me make my, uh, the, the hot cross buns. <laughs> they are, Anyway, we won't talk yeah. about that. They are not the prettiest, but they are very tasty. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because I've also seen when you've made the little mini loaves. Yeah. If you're making small loaves or you've got a, even a larger loaf and you're trying to wait, work out, it's done its proving, yeah. you've, you're happy with it now, you're ready to have it in for its final bake. Yeah. What sort of space do you need to have around that loaf for it to grow and expand in baking? Yeah. So do you, you don't have it near the top or do you have it like no more than half or two thirds of the way up? Uh, so depending on the size of your, your oven, um, it, let's just use a 60 centimetre built-in oven as an example, um, which is quite a reasonably, in, as far as height goes, it's a reasonably high cavity. So you can quite happily do two shelves. If your oven can happily fit two shelves in, you can do two shelves at once. Um, if no, you... I meant in the tin. Oh, okay. Like yeah. in the tin, because I've seen you when you've made those little loaves for yeah. the dinner parties and stuff. Yeah. And each of those little loaves just comes out perfectly just out of the, like they've all got, like, they look amazing. But it, how did you, when you put them in, how did you know how much dough to put into that little, into the tin? Yes. To, oh, okay. <laughs> So, you um, so, so what, I do, what I do, what I do, yeah. Two so, thirds. what I do is after it's proved, you knock generally knock it. What's called knocking it back, um, and you'll give it another quick knead, uh, and then portion it. Okay, so we've made our dough, we've proved it, it's doubled in size, it's now been tipped out onto the bench top, and we've kind of knocked it back, proved it, then cut it into rough approximate size. Let's say thirty grams, just as a round number for a small little loaf um so what you're asking me i think if i'm understanding right what you're asking me is how full should the tin look yeah okay uh i will generally say that when the dough goes in and it's being knocked back uh about a third full okay that low yeah maybe okay. maybe fractionally more maybe closer to a half okay uh but a third to a half full and what you should see, because generally, like let's say a base white loaf, you're going to let it prove again for anywhere up to half an hour again. So it has another little prove before it goes in. So that prove will bring it back up because you've knocked it back. So that prove should bring it back up to close to the edge of the tin, as in the edge of the top of the tin. And then when you bake, it'll have a big jump. And that big jump actually happens within the first about 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've seen you do that, and I know at the moment we're not having dinner parties with yeah. our social isolation, but 
but they are really effective when you've got rather than just little round rolls, which look okay. Yeah. But those little loaves that you get from you having a specialist little tin that you can get yeah. from anywhere. And you can you can bake bread in anything. Like you can do it in a terracotta pot. You can you know there's like you're limited by your imagination about what you can as long as it's heat proof about what you can bake it in. So. Yeah, I just I tend to go anywhere between a third and a half when the raw dough is in because it's going to have another proof where it's going to jump a little bit and then it'll go into the oven and it'll jump a lot. Okay. Because if that dough was full, let's say the t- the the raw dough was up to the level of the tin as far as height, it's going to prove again and it will actually spill over the sides. And then it will bake and the dough will actually tip over a bit. So mm. anywhere from a third to a half of raw dough in your tin. And even if it doesn't quite make it all the way up the top and you don't have this perfectly domed white tin loaf, like who cares? Um, as long as it's baked properly. That's for me the, the That's one. always the killer. Yeah. And if you're going to add rosemary and olives or cheese and garlic or something like that, yep. what does that do to the cooking time? Yep, so depends on the quantity that you add, number one. Uh, don't go nuts though. Like, don't go crazy with the amount that you add. Um, for something like a, let's say we're just, we've got our standard, I'll go back to our standard white loaf, um, and you've got some olives in there, and you want to put some olives in there, you want to make sort of an olive bread, sort of. Um, I'd probably, for a standard tin size, let's say a rectangular tin size, I, w- I wouldn't look at any more than sort of 12 to 15 olives and just give them a slight chop. Okay. Um, if you want to put them in whole, you're going to find it difficult to get the olives in to mixed into the dough whole easily because um, they're either being kept in olive oil or brine and sometimes they're even washed. So they're going to be slippery and it's very hard to get something slippery like that embedded in a dough properly. And when do you add whatever flavourings you want after after you've knocked it back the second time? No, no, at, at your initial... At the very beginning. Yeah, sure, why not? Okay, yeah. oh, no. Or, or you could, I mean, if you're using cheese, sometimes you'll want to add it after you knock it back. Mm-hmm. Um, so you want to add a bit of cheese to it. Sometimes after you knock it back is a good point, depending on the cheese. If it's really hard cheese doesn't matter, but if you're using a soft cheese that's going to uh, not melt but going to break down quite a bit because mm-hmm. all of that, if that happens, what it's it's inhibiting the yeast, yeah? So all you, you're adding volume in there which is going to stop the dough from rising properly. So you can, depending on what you add, um, you can add it at the initial stages. So if we're doing, like olives are a good example. If we're doing olives, I'll just throw it in with the flour and the water and away I go and just do it from the start. Because what actually happens is is that the olives will, even though I chop them a little bit, the olives during the kneading process get broken down a little bit more, like the dough hook hits them, breaks them down, and then you get those sort of purpley streaks through your dough as well. So you get a bit more flavour throughout the dough. Um, something like a cheese, depending on what the cheese is. So if you're doing, I think we've done, I've done recipes for like those pull apart things that people have. Mm -hmm. Um, so that I'll do towards the end, uh, and just sort of dot it in the spots where I think it's going to go. Um, you can add it on top. You can just experiment with it. There's no tried and true law about how you should do it at all. Do you have a favorite flavoring that you add to your bread? No, I, I tend not to. Although one of my first jobs was at a pretty famous bakery back in the day in, in Melbourne called Potts Bakery, and they claimed to be one of the first to sort of do commercial sourdoughs. This is uh, quite a while ago. I was a teenager, I think, when I was working there. Um, and they did a capsicum bread. And it was just very simply like sautéed capsicums, which went into the into the um, dough. It was absolutely. I've never been able to mimic it. Absolutely delicious. I don't know what the the base dough was awesome in itself. That was really good, but like I don't have a 
have a favourite. I've got a real soft spot for types of breads, so I really like baguettes, always have, um, and brioche. Got a bit of a thing for brioche, but I love bagel, bagels too. So it's, I don't really have a favourite. I like all bread. There you are. All bread's good bread. Yes, and at the moment uh, with all this flour, and well, if you can't find flour, my sister-in-law has uh, a few years ago ahead of the trend got a mill. Ah, uh, yes, your sister-in-law does have her own. She meal. does have her own mill. And uh, so maybe we should, uh, for those interested, I can uh, maybe... Uh, Why don't you do a podcast with her, Linda? That'd be interesting. Oh, and how to mill your own flour. I don't yeah. know that she's... Yes. Thank you for that, Paul. I'll, <laughs> I'll just put that one to the keeper, I think, for a little while. But, um, um, but social yeah. isolation, Paul. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. But, it's, but it is interesting that, you know, there's um, a lot more ways, you know, these days of people... Um, now that we're spending more, a lot more time at home, or some of us, um, it's a great opportunity to experiment and to yeah. and to get kids involved in this too. Because I think bread's a great way yeah. for kids. Biscuits and bread are easy for kids to feel like they've made something, and it's a great success. Yeah, when I make a loaf of bread at home, I always put aside like a hundred grams for my little fella, and he sits there and needs it while I need the rest. And I always bake his separately to the main loaf. So he gets his own little baked loaf. Oh, that's fantastic. Bread. Well, yeah. it's, you know, it's a sense of achievement. And when you achieve something, it motivates you to do it again. Yeah. So, but don't be scared of failure, though. That's the thing. Like, don't be scared if your first couple don't work. Um, but just have a think as to why that didn't work. And if you're not like, sure, send us a, uh, an yeah, email, drop absolutely. it online. Put something on one of the uh, recipes as a query. Yeah, info we'll at cookingwithsteam.com. Yeah. And we'll come back to you. Yeah, we can come back to you. Maybe we could do a live streaming of this one day. I love your idea of you, because um, for those of you who can't see Paul, yeah. he had his hands up in the air and he was wobbling them around, showing me how to to hang dough to check that it was knocked down. We're not around. hanging well, dough. No, but the window yeah. pane effect. Uh, yeah, that and was, uh, that, that, that would be a good maybe. Okay. Super, <laughs> Sorry, so I, have, I haven't listened to the yeah. transcript yet. But that was uh, that could be something that would be a good webinar maybe. Yeah, could which, do. Yes, which we're getting to. So thanks for listening, guys. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Linda. Bye. See ya. Thanks for listening to this podcast as we explore home cooking in a modern world. We'd love you to subscribe. And for more information, please go to our website, cookingwithsteam.com. Mm-hmm.